Hey there, today we're going to take a look at events and task scheduling in Nest.js, which can help us speed our application up and decrease coupling, which are both things we want when developing a back end service. So I'm in a new directory here and I'm going to run nest new Nest.js events tasks to create a new project and I'll use PNPM as my package manager. So after our project is finished installing, we'll go ahead and CD into that project. And then we're going to have to install a few packages. So the first one is going to be nest.js slash event emitter. So go ahead and install this package. And then for task scheduling, we're going to have to install nest.js slash schedule. And then finally, we're going to install the types for the cron package. So once we have all of these packages installed, we can go on ahead and run pmpm start dev to go ahead and start our development server. So now that we're inside of our project in VS Code, I'm gonna go ahead and open up the app module. And in our imports array, we're gonna to have to set up the event emitter and the scheduler module. So first for the event emitter module, we'll import this from nest.js slash event emitter and then call for root to initialize it. And then we'll also set up the schedule module for root from nest.js schedule. Now both of these modules here can take an options object for further configuration. I'm gonna leave the defaults for now because out of the box they work fine, but I'll leave a link in the description to where you can learn more about these options. So now that we've imported these modules, let's go ahead and open up the app.controller. And in here, let's go ahead and create a new post route where we can make a mock call to create a user in our system. So here we'll get the body from the request. And so we'll annotate this with body from nest.js common. And then we want to provide the type for the body here. So let's quickly go ahead and create a DTO folder in our source directory. And then I'll create a new file called create user.request.ts. And so we'll just simply export a create user request in here that takes the email of the new user we want to create as well as the password, which are both strings. So now back in our app controller, our body we can now say is of type create user request, and we'll provide a return type of promise void here. So then we're gonna offload this call to our app service and simply say create user where we pass in the body. So now let's actually go into our app.service and we can start playing around with the event emitter and the scheduler. So let's go ahead and create our async create user function in here, which we know takes the body of type create user request. And the first thing I wanna do is log a message in here just to say that we're creating the user. So let's create a new logger up top. We'll say logger is equal to new logger from nest.js common. And we'll just pass in the app service.name to give some context to these logs. So in here we'll say this.logger.log and we'll just simply say creating user and maybe we'll provide the body so we can actually see what's getting sent to the service. So now in Postman, if I send off a post request to our localhost 3000 server with a body of email and password, we send this off and then look at our logs, we can see our creating user log statement with the body that we're sending. So now in our create user function, let's say after we create a new user, we want to do a few actions. The first of which is we want to send them an email and then we want to send them a welcome gift. Now, typically what you could do is you could do both of these actions in the create user function. However, the issue with this is that both of these actions might take a good amount of time and the client which requested to create the user doesn't really care about waiting for the email to be sent and the welcome gift to be sent. All it cares about is getting response back that says that the user was persisted and no other asynchronous actions have to block us. So in order to decouple this functionality to the point where all we do in here is create the user and then we do these other actions, we can use events and we can use the event emitter. So let's go ahead and see this in practice. I'll inject the event emitter up top, which is gonna be of type event emitter two. So in create user, this is where we've created the user and you could pretend that we've persisted to the database and now we wanna to return to the client to return as quickly as possible. 
However, bef before we do that, let's send off the user created event so that additional functionality can be accomplished. So we'll call this dot event emitter dot emit. Now emit takes the name of the event that we want to emit. So this can be any string. So we'll call user dot created as the event name. And then we can provide the payload, which is any data that will be passed along to the functions that are listening to this event. So I want to pass a user created event in here. To do that, I'll create a new events folder. And then we'll create a user created event.ts. And this will be a class that will just hold some information about the user created event. So I'm going to create a constructor where we get the user ID that was just created, as well as the email. So now we have both of these pieces of information. We can create our user created event. Now I want to pass in a fake user ID. So I'll just create one up here and set it to one, two, three. So now in the constructor call, we'll pass in the user ID and then we'll pass in the email from the body. So now after we created the user, we simply fired off this user created event and we return back to the client without waiting for whatever this event causes. Now I actually want to react to this event and do some work in a separate thread so that we don't block the response to the client. So what we'll do is we'll create a function decorated with the on event decorator where we specify the event we want to listen to. So it's as simple as that. We just pull user.created, which is the same name we emitted earlier. And then we'll say welcome new user that takes in a payload of the user created event. And in here, this is where you could potentially send an email to a new user. We'll simply log out a message that says welcoming new user. And we can provide the payload.email. So now back in Postman, if we send off a new request to create a user, we should see in our logs that we did create the user, creating the user and here's the body. But then we also have our event handler here where we welcome the new user and provide the email that's coming from this payload. Now we can have multiple event handlers listening for the same event. So if we have one event handler that's welcoming the new user, we can have another one that will send a gift to this new user. So let's say we have an async send welcome gift function. It's going to get the same payload user created event. And because this function is asynchronous, we want to actually provide that in the decorator here so that it's called properly. So we'll say async is set to true. And now we could do some async work inside of this function. So I'll call this dot log or dot log and we'll say sending welcome gift. I'll of course provide that email again in the log statement. Now let's simulate some sort of asynchronous delay where we would be sending the welcome gift. So to do this, I'll just await a new promise here where all we do is just wait using set timeout. And after a certain amount of time, we'll resolve this promise and we'll say we want this to happen after three seconds. So 3000 milliseconds. And after this asynchronous action, We'll call this dot log or dot log welcome gift sent, where we provide the payload email again. So now back in Postman, let's quickly send a request off. Go ahead and look at our logs. We can see a bit of a delay there where we saw sending welcome gift and then the welcome gift was sent in addition to the other event handler where we welcomed the new user. So we can really see the power of these events in that it allows us to decouple functionality in our application and all asynchronous work can be handled in separate threads, so to say. So now that we've looked at events, let's take a look at scheduling tasks in Nest.js. So Nest with their schedule module makes this very easy. Let's go ahead and take advantage of a decorator from this package, the cron decorator. So the cron decorator is super powerful it uses a special pattern that allows you to provide a string representation of when you want events to occur. And I will actually include a link in the description to where you can read more about this string pattern. However, out of the box, Nest also exports cron expression, which is a number of useful predefined patterns that lets you execute code every certain interval. 
So in our case, let's go ahead and use every 10 seconds. And you can see all of the patterns here. They get very specific every 30 seconds between nine and six and so forth. We want every 10 seconds. So every 10 seconds, this bit of code will be executed. And we'll say we will delete expired users every 10 seconds. So in a logger, we'll simply log deleting expired users. So now back in our terminal, we should see every 10 seconds a log statement saying deleting expired users, which would represent some sort of asynchronous action every 10 seconds. So here we go with the first log statement. And this will continue every 10 seconds until your application stops. Now, this is a very useful way. Uh, if you know ahead of time, you have certain tasks that you want to execute using the static cron decorator is a very good approach. However, in some cases you want to trigger certain code to occur dynamically. And in order to do that, we can use the schedule registry uh, service here. So we'll call private scheduler registry, which is of type scheduler registry. So with this scheduler registry, there's a whole lot that we can do. And if we take a look at the methods offered by it, scheduler registry dot, you can see a number of useful methods. So if you look at the methods here, we can see we can dynamically add cron jobs, intervals and timeouts. Now intervals are similar to cron jobs where they will execute code every amount of time you specify. And then the timeout is like set timeout where it'll execute code once after a certain amount of time. And of course it has corresponding methods to delete cron jobs, intervals and timeouts. Now you can actually specify the name of a cron job like we specified over here with the options object where you specify the name. So in this case we'll have delete expired users. And then you could use that dynamic schedule registry to even delete this cron job or add it back from this name here. What we're going to do is after we emit this user created event, let's go ahead and say we want to establish a WebSocket connection after five seconds after the user has been created. We want to establish a WebSocket connection. So in order to do this, first we'll need to create the timeout interval actually. So we'll get this in a variable and call it establish WebSocket timeout. So this will be equal to set timeout where we provide a function that we want to call. And in this case, I'll just create a simple private function below called establish WebSocket connection that takes the user ID of type string. And this is where we would establish some sort of WebSocket connection with the user. In this case, we can just call this dot logger dot log and say establishing WebSocket connection with user and pass in the user ID. So now in our set timeout, we'll call this dot establish WebSocket connection, pass in our user ID, and then we can specify when we want this to occur. So let's say after five seconds, so 5,000 milliseconds, we want this code to execute. Now to actually ensure that this set timeout occurs even after we return from this function, we are going to use a scheduler registry. We'll call scheduler registry dot add timeout. Now we'll provide the name of the timeout. So this is if you wanted to maybe delete it later on or check if it exists, you'll do so by this name. And we'll call it user ID underscore establish WebSocket. So it'll be scoped to each user and they'll have their own timeout here. Lastly, we'll provide the set timeout function we created above. Now, importantly, this scheduler registry is an in-memory store. It's not distributed. So if you have multiple instances of your app running, you'll need to keep that in mind. So let's go ahead and see this in action. Back in Postman, we should expect to see this WebSocket connection established five seconds after we send this request. So let's send it off and look in our logs. We can see our welcome gift was sent and there we see our WebSocket connection has been established with the user ID and we can still see our cron job is running in the background. So this has been a very brief introduction into events and task scheduling. They're both very powerful when used properly. In my next video, 
I will be walking through an end-to-end -end ultimate guide around Nest.js microservices. So if that's something you think you'd be interested in, make sure you subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.